Okay, looks like it's starting again. Well, that was that was pretty rude. I was like well into it and it just stopped unexpectedly. Interesting. I didn't even say anything that would have warranted that. So that's strange. Come on, Facebook. Okay, so I'll just cut to the chase. Um, we're doing uh, inside scripture is First Peter four seven through eleven, Genesis twenty five and twenty six, and Matthew eight one through seventeen. Um, light study, light Bible study. I just mean that I'm just going to kind of give an overall uh, explanation of some of the of what's going on, especially mostly in the Old Testament because New Testament. It's pretty much self-explanatory, but unless something in Matthew just jumps right out at me. First Peter 4, 7, and 11 is the insight scripture, and they already have something that explains it, which is beautiful. So, um, but, you know, and I already prayed and everything. Uh, we'll do it again, though. Father, I just ask that you pray. Uh, Father. Oh, Father, I'm so glad you know what's in my heart. I'm just, I, I forgive me for being flustered with the, this equipment. Father, I just ask that you bless the reading of your word tonight or today. I ask that you give us understanding, discernment, knowledge, and wisdom. As I ask every time I open your word, Father, let it speak to our hearts. Let it grow the knowledge inside of us, Father. Help us to, to grow in our walk with you and our relationship with you. Father, let us honor this time we spend in your word and let it be solely focused on time with you. And let it be enjoyment, Father, and not a burden. And not something to be rushed through so that we can get on to what we really want to do type situation. Let this be what we really want to do, Father. And that's to spend time with you in prayer and reading your word. For I know you speak to us through your word, Lord. I ask again, Father, to please put a special hedge of protection around Israel. I know, Father, what your word says about your people and your land. And especially Amir Sarfati, who does so much to keep us updated in what's going on in Israel, but also to help helps me for sure and a lot of people to teach us about eschatology and end times and from the Hebrew side as well as the Christian side, Father. And I just they're they're in their bunkers, Father. They're in their their bomb shelters because it's getting really bad. Father, I can't help but see two prophecies that look like they're fulfilling before our eyes, which means the rapture is so very close. And there's so many people I know of personally, Father, that aren't ready. They're not ready. If Jesus was to come right now, they do not have their house in order. They do not have their, their lives established with your son. Father, I just ask that there be a mighty outpouring of your Holy Spirit, Father. Those that you've chosen, that you've called to yourself, I just ask that you call them back to you. Those that were raised in your house, Father, when they were young, let them be to that mature age that your word speaks of, that when they are mature, they will turn back. Father, help them to turn back to you before the rapture. But I ask you to bless the hearing and the reading of your word today. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you for walking while I was reading. That's so awesome. First Peter 4, 7 through 11. Serving for God's glory. <clears throat> but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. <laughs> Ironic. <laughs> and above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And it, mouse. <laughs> and in the uh, insight, it, it, actually I kind of got them backwards. 
I usually read what it's talking about at first, and then I read the scripture, so it's all good. But So it says in 1 Peter 4, the apostle challenges the church to hospitality, then reinforces that challenge with a call to service in verses 10 and 11. In verse 10, he reminds believers that we've received gifts for that very purpose, and we utilize these gifts in serving others. We become expressions of God's grace. As we utilize those gifts in serving others, we become expressions of God's grace. It appears from these statements that Peter is giving his readers a glimpse into the realm of spiritual gifts about which Paul wrote in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. Spiritual gifts are the Holy Spirit's provision for equipping followers of Jesus to help one another. 1 Corinthians 12, 7. While Paul offers a more extended list of these gifts, Peter compresses them into two basic categories, speaking gifts and serving gifts. 1 Peter 4.11, both provide support and resources for the kind of hospitality described in today's devotional. As we encourage people with the scriptures and help them by acts of service, the family of God is strengthened and the hurting are helped. And the, the story for today is called a warm welcome. Who will hug everybody? Make sure it doesn't end on me again. I was reading this story when it ended on me. <laughs> that was one of the questions our friend Steve asked after he got the news that he had cancer and realized he would be away from the church for a while. No. Aw. Steve is the kind of man who makes everyone feel welcome. That was that would be like that would be like Danny from my old church. Oh, I'm not burning cornbread on him. Ah, oh, with a friendly greeting, a warm handshake, and even a holy hug for some. Danny, Daniel Hervey gives the best hugs. Oh my goodness. Uh, even a holy hug for some. To adapt an application from Romans 16:16, 16, 16, which says, "Greet one another with a holy kiss." And now, as we pray for Steve, that God will heal him, he is concerned that as he goes through surgery and treatment and is away from our church for a time, we will miss out on those welcoming greetings. Perhaps not all of us are cut out to greet one another as openly as Steve does, but his example of caring for people is a good reminder to us. Notice that Peter says to offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Or in a way that centers on love, 1 Peter 4, 9, see Philippians 2, 14. While first century hospitality included offering accommodations to travelers, uh, even that always starts with a welcoming greeting. As we interact with others in love, whether with a hug or just a friendly smile, we do so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 4.11, and this was written by Dave Brannon. Philippians 2.14, huh? Oh, wrong way, Davey. You know where Philippians is, goodness. You know where Philippians is. Really? Yeah. 2.14. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Questioning the word of God, which is brought on by murmurings, in other words. Okay. Uh, reflect and pray. Lord, help us to represent you to others. Guide us to show hospitality in a way that will show others your love. When we practice hospitality, we share God's goodness. Amen. Okay. Ah, Genesis 25, Abraham and, yeah, let me get my, my little notes for how to pronounce all these lovely names, <laughs> because some of them, it looks like it'd be obvious, and it's so not, <laughs> so, so not, uh, let's see, could have sworn I wrote that one down, but I guess I did not, well, okay, just kidding. Um, all right, Abraham again took a wife, and her name was Keturah, 
and she bore him Zimran. Let's see. Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan begot Sheba and Dedan, and the sons of Dedan were Asherim, Letushim, and, let's see, how do I say here? Liamum. Le, yeah, Liamum. And did I say that one right? Ash, Asherim, Asherim, Latushim, and Liam, 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 wow, Liamum. <laughs> yeah. And the sons of Midian were Epha, Epher, Hanak, Hanak, Abda, Ab Abda. I'm pretty sure, yeah, if I didn't write it down, I had it. And then Elda, Elda, because I remember Elda is pronounced like if I had a Yankee accent and I was saying the word elder, it'd be like Elda, Elda. That's right. All these were the children of Keturah. And Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac. But Abraham gave gifts to the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had. And while he was still living, he sent them eastward, away from Isaac, his son, to the country of East. Now, in my studies, I was, you know, listening to different people. And when it says that he gave gifts to the sons of the concubines, because evidently, Keturah is a Gentile. So that's how those that are not of Jewish descent are also children of Abraham for the record. And uh, so those children, they couldn't, oh, dang, I wish I wrote that down because I have literally slept since then. Oh, man. Um, well, I don't remember what they said now, but there was a reason why he had to send them away. Um, dang it. Well, anyway, I don't remember now. Doggone it. I should have just did this then. Um, but the gifts was nothing like what the inheritance was that obviously Isaac received. But, you know, that's because Isaac was from God for, you know, the one that was promised, the son that was promised to Jacob, I mean to Abraham. Anyway. Anyway. So, and he sent them eastward, away from Isaac, his son, to the country of the east. I really wish I remember what they said about that. Doggone it. <laughs> Give me two seconds. Because it was important. It really was. Dang it. I hate my brain sometimes. Okay. Okay. Here it is. There is a vast difference in mere gifts than the entirety of the inheritance. I read it. That's what it was. In the natural or literal sense of the same holds true. Those who follow the way of the cross can have no fellowship with those who follow the way of the flesh. Okay. Oh, and Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac, saying, only the child of the spirit can be heir to the promises. So... Yeah. Okay. So this is the generations of children of Abraham uh, that will receive their inheritance, uh, which, of course, speaks of the church. Okay. So that's what that's about. That's what that was. I'm sorry. Okay. Anyway, continuing. Uh, Adam's death and burial. I wish I hadn't moved my mouse. <laughs> This is the sum of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived, 175 years. Then Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. And his sons, Isaac and Ishmael, buried him in the cave of Machpelah. Machpelah, yeah, Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite the field which Abraham purchased from the sons of Heth. There Abraham was buried and Sarah his wife. And it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac. And Isaac dwelt at Beer Lahoi, Lahay, 
Fred had to pronounce that. Roy. Lahoy Roy. That's right. Lahay Roy. Lahoy Roy. Whatever. The families of Ishmael and Isaac. Now, this is the genealogy of Ishmael, Abraham's son. Oh, boy, oh, boy. <laughs> whom Hagar, the Egyptian, Sarah's maidservant, bore to Abraham. And these were the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names according to their generations. The firstborn of Ishmael. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, then uh, Kedar, oh, actually they rolled it, it was Kedar, um, Ab Adbil, uh, Midsum, Mishma, Duma, Massa, Hadar, Tima, Jatur, Navish, uh, Kadi, lost my place. Oh, Kadima, sorry. These were the sons of Ishmael, and these were their names by their towns and their settlements. Twelve princes according to their nations. How interesting. See, this is why they should teach the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. James, I never caught this before. There were 12 tribes of Ishmael. Ishmael as well. Did you know that? Yeah. D the genealogy of Ishmael is what, yeah, his 12 sons were 12 princes according to their nations. Well, they're not tribes, but there were 12 princes for 12 nations. They said that he would be, you know, that there would be many nations. But it's kind of like 12 tribes, right? Because the 12 tribes of, of Israel are nations, are they not? Same difference. Except once are 12 nations of flesh, whereas Jacob, Israel, they're 12 nations of, as, as I read a minute ago in the Bible, of the spirit. Because it was it was the blessing from God given to him, uh, Abraham that they would have have this son. Yes, that he would be the father of many nations. Okay. Wow. 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 Never never caught that before. Wow. Sorry. Anyways, picking up on verse seventeen. These were the years of the life of Ishmael. 137 years, and he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. They dwelt from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt, as you go toward Assyria. He died in the presence of all his brethren. This is the genealogy of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as wife the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his plea, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her, and she said, If all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over. So they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Yeah, Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. So the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Esau sells his birthright. Now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that red, same red stew, for I am weary. 
Therefore, his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die. So what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now I'm going to stop right there for just a second because I want to cover a couple things. Now I know in the scriptures it says that uh, God hated Esau, but he, lo he loved Jacob, but he hated Esau. Um, just understand that the word hated in this text, it doesn't mean like with malicious hate, like he hates his sin, like he hates sin. It means he thought less of in this respect. And, and another thing on this also is as far as him selling his birthright. Uh, let's see, where am I? Okay. Let's see. So when he said, Jacob said, sell me this day your birthright. The birthright then dealt primarily with spiritual things of which Esau had no regard or concern. It had to do with the earthly inheritance of Canaan, but would take place hundreds of years in the future. It referred to the possession of the covenant blessing, which included his seed being as the stars of the sky and all the families of the earth being blessed in him. As well, it was the progen progenitorship of the promised seed, which was the greatest blessing of all and spoke of Christ. The firstborn was to receive the birthright and Esau was the firstborn. And Esau said, Behold, I'm at the point to die. What profit shall this birthright do to me? Esau bartered future and eternal wealth for present and temporary need. He had no concern for spiritual things, so the birthright meant nothing to him. So <coughs> Jacob, being known as the deceiver, took advantage of this and said, Swear to me this day. And so he swore unto him and he sold his birthright to Jacob. Jacob, deplorable as was his character, valued divine and eternal blessing, and he had placed himself in God's hands. The prophecy made to his mother before he was born would have been fulfilled to him, and without the degra degradation and suffering which his own scheming brought upon him. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink, and rose up and went his way. Then Esau despised his birthright. The natural heart places no value on the things of God, as we see evidenced in the choices made by Esau. To the natural heart, God promises, God's promises are a vague, valueless, powerless thing, simply because God is not known. Upon that which the unredeemed cannot see, they place no value. Thus, it was with Esau. Okay, Genesis 26, and we're still going good. Isaac and Abimelech. And, okay, there was a famine in the land besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. All right. Um, now, Abimelech is a title, somewhat like president or pharaoh. So this was not the same man who dealt with Abraham a time of some 80 or more years having now passed. This seal knows this is a different one. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I will give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So Isaac dwelt in Gerar, and the men of the place asked about his wife, and he said, She is my sister. For he was afraid to say, She is my wife. Because she is beautiful to behold. That's verse 7. 
the patriarch practices deception here exactly as he did as did his father Abraham. It is positive that Isaac knew in detail of his father's episode in Egypt and the wrongness of the act. So why did he follow the same course? And it says, when it says, because she is beautiful, the child of God must never act out of fear, but always from the position of faith. Okay, there we go. Okay. So now it came to pass when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked through a window and saw, and there was Isaac showing endearment to Rebekah, his wife. Then Abimelech called Isaac and said, quite obviously, she is your wife. So how could you say she is my sister? Isaac said to him, because I said, lest I die on account of her. And Abimelech said, what is this you have done to us? One of the people might soon have, have lain with your wife and you would have brought guilt on us. So Abimelech charged all his people saying, he who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. The man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous, for he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. So the Philistines envied him. Now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, and they had filled them with the earth. And Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. Then Isaac departed from there and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and there and dwelt there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father, for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names which his father had called them. Now Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of running water there. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. So he called the name of the well Esek, because they quarreled with him. Then they dug another well, and they quarreled over that one also. So he called its name Sitna. And he moved from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth. Because he said, for now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. Then he went up there, went up from there to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am your God, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord, and he pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants dug a well. Then Abimelech came to him from Gerar with Ahuzeth, one of his friends, and Fickle, the commander of his army. And Isaac said to them, Why have you come to me, since you hate me and have sent me away from you? But they said, We have certainly seen that the Lord is with you. So we said, Let there now be an oath between us, between you and us. Let us make a covenant with you that you will do us no harm since we have not touched you and since we have done nothing to you but good and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. So he made them a feast and they ate and drank. Then they arose early in the morning and swore an oath with one another and Isaac sent them away and they departed from him in peace. And it came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him about the well which they had dug and said to him, we have found water. So he called it Sheba. Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. When Esau was 40 years old, he took his wives, Judith's daughter of Beeri the Hittite, and Bazemuth, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and they were a grief of mind to Isaac and Rebekah. Yeah. These girls were in the line of Ham and Canaan, which was cursed 
That's from Genesis 9, verses 25 and 26. At this time, the Lord recognized only the line of Shem, because through Shem, the Messiah would come. And so that's that's why Esau, God knew right? Esau wasn't going to be carrying on the line because God knows he knows all about us before we're even knitting our mother's womb. Hey, man, sorry. Oh, mercy. And our final reading is Matthew 8, 1 through 17. Is that right? I can't find my little daily bread. It has escaped from the earth somewhere. I think that is right, though. Okay, we'll go with it. Could have sworn it was. Um, I could have sworn it was healing the mother, but uh, I think it ends there. Jesus cleanses the leper. When he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, the leper came and worshipped him, saying, "Lord." If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one, but go your way. Show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Jesus heals a centurion servant. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. I'm oh, sorry. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. Peter's mother-in-law healed. Now when Jesus had come into Peter's house, Oops, oops, oh, well, forget that does that. Bleh. He saw his wife's mother lying sick with a fever. So he touched her hand and the fever left her and she arose and served them. Many healed in the evening. When evening had come, they brought, in, brought to him many who were demon possessed and he cast out the spirits with the word and healed all who were sick that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses father i just thank you for your word i just thank you for the many blessings in your word i thank you for all these things that that yeshua did for us not only while here on the earth but while on the cross <clears throat> and how he continues through the holy spirit how you continue with the holy spirit to guide and comfort us and to, to show us that what we need to do. Father, I ask you add a blessing and hearing to your word. And as you bless any and all that, that read your word today and that spend time in fellowship with you. And we pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I hope you all have a blessed day. Know that Jesus loves you and I love you. And uh, some of you I may hopefully see you at church tonight. Shalom.